You know, I, uh, one of the fun things I've really been doing, enjoying doing this summer occasionally is get out and, um, getting it out on my bike. And a day like we've had the last week, it's a great time to get out on your bike and do something, right? I was a late bloomer when it came to riding bicycles. I was embarrassed, but to tell you the truth, I can say it now. But when I was about nine years old, I learned. And I remember, because I had waited so long and was so excited to finally learn, the joy of riding my bike in my driveway was just amazing. It was a fairly large driveway, and that was the only place my mom would let me ride at first, because we lived on a road that we lived, the house was on a hill, to go down the driveway, you went rather rapidly onto the road, which was at the crest near the top of the hill, and then it went rather quickly all the way down to the bottom of the hill where there was a large black tar wood bridge, but only one lane. And my mom did not want me going out to the crest of that hill on that busy road and down that road to where that bridge was down that big long hill. Now, I couldn't quite understand this. I thought I'm doing perfectly fine about the second day. And I just know that mom came out and told me before I went out there, she said, she said to me that I could enjoy the, um, I could enjoy the, the partake of the joys of the driveway. But the day I attempted to partake of the joys of the road would be the day that I would surely die or something like that. And I didn't believe her, as most nine-year-old boys might think. Mom's telling me something I shouldn't do, and the chance to prove my mom wrong about something was more like she was giving me an invitation to go and do it. So I was on my bike, and I was edging towards the driveway where it beginning to descend, and I found myself going down, turning right onto that street in front of my house, and all of a sudden, the bike was picking up speed. At first, I was pedaling as fast as I could. And the joy of the moment of being in the wind and feeling it blow against my face, it, I started building up so much speed, it felt as if the road itself was moving beneath me and itself was moving and I was standing still. But then I could feel myself gripping through the candle handlebars. I was terrified and at the same time exhilarated. And I found myself having to keep up with the speed of the pedals, because now I wasn't pedaling, they were pedaling themselves. And then I saw, as I approached near the bottom of the hill, the bridge, and there was a car coming across that bridge. And I, for a moment, completely panicked, couldn't remember where the brake was. And I had a flash second to make a decision, to run into the car coming towards me, probably braking by now, or to run to the left of the bridge and fly off the, the bitch and land into that deep rocky ditch that we had enjoyed exploring so much, but that was more than I wanted to take in. Or the third choice was to hit the end of the bridge. I hit the end of that bridge. I can still remember flying over the handlebars as if it were in slow motion. I flew, it seemed like forever, until I landed onto the pavement and skint up badly both my knees, my elbow, and hurt my wrist. But I survived. I got up bloodied. My bike there with the wheel bent my pride bent more than that as I had to march back up the hill and go present myself to my mom. I don't know how mothers do it, but they have a way of having competing feelings at the same time. My mom felt a rush of compassion, but also quite a bit of disgust and anger with me as she, as she uh, put me back together. And she said, why didn't you listen to me I knew this would happen, and you didn't listen. I could tell that what she really wanted to say was, well, 
Maybe because this happened, you've learned your lesson, but she held that one back. Well, you can understand that when I would hear um, uh, this story that we read from today, that that was the first story, the first thought that came to mind was that memory of mine. And I know you probably have something like it in your past, right? Everyone here, not listening to the parents' wisdom. Today we hear uh, words like that, words in the book of Proverbs, the first chapter of Proverbs, from a personification of wisdom called Lady Wisdom. In case you didn't hear it, I want you to really listen for a second time. Come here and listen to me. I'll pour out the spirit of wisdom upon you and make you wise. I have called you so often, but you would not come. I have pleaded, but all in vain. For you have spurned my counsel and reproof. Someday you'll be in trouble. <laughs> I'm going to laugh. Mock me, will you? <laughs> I'll mock you. When the storm of terror surrounds you, when you're engulfed by anguish and distress, then I will not answer your cry for help. It will simply be too late. And you will search for me ever so anxiously, but you will not find me. For you closed your eyes to the facts. And you did not choose the reverence and trust of the Lord. The Old Testament uh, collection of Proverbs, this personification of wisdom as a wise lady, a wise woman, spending her day, she goes out into the countryside and she goes out to the marketplace where the people gather and she tries to give her wisdom to anyone who will listen. She speaks in places where everyone has a chance to listen to what she's got to say. She cries out her advice and no one will listen. Now, I have an idea uh, that many of you, when you hear this reading, will immediately start applying it, as I did when I first heard it. No doubt it will spurn thoughts of people who have refused to wear the mask, who object to it because they feel like it's an imposition on their freedom, or people who have chosen not to be vaccinated, not because they have medical reasons they can't be, but because they simply just don't want to be vaccinated for a variety of other reasons. And you will think, boy, how appropriate these words are for those folks. How long will you scoff at wisdom and ignore the facts? We can hear Lady Wisdom pleading, but we can also hear our medical community throughout the world and all the nations of the world struggling with this, by the way, not just us. Almost in unity, they're saying, they and the scientists, wear the mask. Unless you've got some rare reason medically get the vaccine but they do not listen and you can hear lady wisdom pleading and begging and wanting conjoling someone to listen just as so many of our leaders have felt within themselves please listen or you will face the consequences of what will happen and that's exactly what happens right when you don't listen to wisdom in fact and the truth the reality of what is Sometimes you have to pay the consequence, as Lady Wisdom said we would. And we hear these words, and we hear the frustration. Now, it's a good thing to recognize that. I think this obviously applies to present circumstances, but, you know, we have a way of being uncompassionate in some ways, and a way of, of judging and pointing the finger. What's that old saying? You point the finger, but the thumb, you're, who's it pointing? It's pointing back at you. We come to church not just to feel smug and write about something that we're on the right side and other people are all wrong. But we also come hopefully to hear God's wisdom for us. That these words that Lady Wisdom are speaking are speaking now to you. That there's some part of who you are in your life that needs to hear what she's got to say. And as I listened to this and read and thought more thoughtfully about this beyond my first impressions, I began to realize there's something we're struggling with as a people. And as, that is that, yes, Lady Wisdom is speaking in, her, in the marketplace, but guess what? In the marketplace of ideas, there's so many other voices I'm not always sure who to listen to. 
You know, when you grow up, you listen to your parents, right? And hopefully you had wise and good parents who gave good advice. And despite the fact that we adults think our kids don't hear us, I know they hear a lot more than we think they do. And hopefully some of that stuff that we teach them will stick. And when they need it in their life, they'll have it there for them. But there'll come a time where our parents will be gone. There'll come a time when circumstances change and some of the things that they taught us, we don't know what to do in the situation now that we find ourselves in. And we wonder, what voices can we listen to if we don't have the wisdom of our parents to help it now think it through because we're off on our own? So many other authorities in our culture and our time are questioned. We don't really know who to trust. Almost all the institutions of our, of our culture are in question now. I'm thinking especially of religion and religious bodies. For whatever reason, fewer people trust what the church has to say. There was a time back in the 1950s, the church was king. Everyone was going to church, listening to every word the pastor would say. But guess what? You don't hear so much of that now. Maybe it's because of the clergy sexual uh, scandals that have happened, especially in the Catholic Church, but not only Catholics, and some Protestant denominations have struggled with this very well, too. Maybe it's because sometimes we hear the harshness of fundamentalism and the moralism, the judgmentalism, and so many people just look at that, we want nothing to do with it. But I sometimes think maybe the other reason church doesn't have so much power in people's lives is that, well, guess what? There's so many voices to listen to, so many perspectives. So much, many people pressing their opinions from so many different angles. Everywhere you turn, you hear some voice on the web, on the internet, on TV, from opinions. You hear everyone being spoken. What's true? What am I to do? And we start to wonder, is there any truth at all? We look at the media and guess what? We don't have Walter Cronkite and those other media people, right? We're long past that. We have 24 seven news and news is often trying to do what? To grab our attention by sensationalizing it. It's not all the same. Some news media is obviously better at giving us the facts and giving us perspective. I'm sorry that people sometimes say, well, it's just all the same, but that's the danger, isn't it? When you have all these views, everyone thinks none of it's trustworthy. They're all the same. And we become very cynical. And when we become cynical, we think, well, maybe there's no, no such thing as real reality and truth. It's whatever you think and you'd like to believe. You can make it up. And if it agrees with everyone you run around with, hey, it's true. Only problem is, that's not true. It's not reality. Lady Wisdom doesn't see it that way. Lady Wisdom knows that if you run really fast at this wall, when you hit it, you're going to fall back and get hurt, no matter how much you think you can go through it. Because it's a wall is a wall. There is reality. There is truth. Sure, truth may sometimes adapt and change. We may know something we didn't know before, and we thought this was true, and we have to change our perspective. But there is truth. And Lady Reality's job is to help us become wise. Now, she's not talking about an intellectual, studied college degree. Some of the wisest people I know don't have a college education. Some of them don't even have a high school educa education, but they're very wise. The kind of wisdom that Lady Wisdom is telling us is a wisdom that is practical. It's functional. It's something you learn by experience. It's something that helps us to be successful in life because we've learned to understand that in this world, there are certain rules of operation, we can call it the laws of nature and, and beyond that, that if we don't understand, we're gonna be in trouble. There's rules about how you treat other people and how it comes back to you. There's rules about all kinds of things that we have to learn. And this wisdom is built upon the understanding that from the beginning of creation, God put wisdom in the world, not necessarily religious wisdom, but just the wisdom to know how to make it in the world. The kind of stuff we want to teach our kids so they can be successful and not fail in their lives. And we learn it more times than not by experience. Hopefully, we learn this kind of wisdom through the wisdom of others who've learned it before so we don't have to. Parents, what is your, one of your main jobs? 
One of your main jobs is to give wisdom to your kids. You want to teach them what they need to know so they can learn it the easy way and not have to learn it the hard way on the playground or later in life in a much more dangerous sphere where they may learn some very, indeed, painful lessons. And if you have something happen to you through experience, hopefully you learn from your mistakes because we learn a lot from our mistakes. And uh, you know, what's the old saying though? Uh, the old saying about learning from our mistakes, you remember uh, the definition of insanity is making the same mistake over and over again and expecting different results. We all know people in ourselves if we think about it who don't seem to learn very fast. I remember when I was doing coaching and support as a counselor for people who were single, how many times would they rush and get into the newest relationship so excited they'd rush and get in emotionally, physically, and within maybe the month, and this was their love, and then it wouldn't work out, and they would repeat that pattern again and again and again, never finding a different way to go about that. We've all been there when you think about it. Things we just didn't learn quick. But guess what? Sometimes there are things that we find uh, we have loved people, that we, people we love dearly that just never seem to learn. I mean, some of you have children or grandchildren. You, you struggle because they just don't seem to get it. And you worry about them because they're not making it. And somehow it never seems to come through. And you pray for them because you care so much about them, but you don't know how to get them to listen, and you can relate to Lady Wisdom trying to get through. It's painful. So we have this wisdom that comes to us today from her. She teaches us through um, our experience, but she also likes to teach us through Proverbs. Proverbs are little pithy, simple statements that are easy to understand, don't need a lot of interpretation. You don't have to be a brilliant person to understand what it's got to say. It just makes sense. And you can memorize them and keep them with you, and they'll teach you something. My youth pastor, one, my first youth pastor, Larry, uh, who lives down in New Orleans, was telling me, uh, gave me a long time ago a little plaque that he made. He's very artistic. He wrote a plaque, embroidered it, and he had something along the lines of, what you put in the life of another will come back to you. Especially the good you put in, right? Now, is that true? Generally speaking, that's good advice, right? You put good in someone's life, oftentimes it does come back to you. You put bad in someone's life, what happens? It oftentimes comes back. Always true? No. We can find exceptions. Proverbs are not always absolutely true. But oftentimes, they are. Proverbs are ubiquitous, too. Proverbs are everywhere we go. One pastor was preaching on Proverbs, and she decided she'd ride around the large town she lived in and look at the neon signs that churches put up, and she found a few Proverbs that people had made up. One is, forbidden fruit makes many jams. Give Satan an inch, and he'll become your ruler. The best vitamin for a Christian is be one. I am for the separation of church and hate. That's my favorite. Then turn you look at Proverbs, you'll discover chapter after chapter of Proverbs, you'll discover experiences of people that have been gathered up over the centuries. So if you turn to the book of Proverbs, this wonderful book, they're just loaded with Proverbs. You can also look in the New Testament, the book of James, which we, I preached from last week. It's got a lot of Proverbs. Jesus has Proverbs in his teaching. So you can look at the teachings of Jesus. The question, Tom Long, he was uh, taught at the theology school, I went to came right after I left. Tom Long was the preaching professor, and biblical professor, and he said, you know, it's not, it's not so much um, it's not so much all the Proverbs we know, but which ones we listen to that matter. Because you can listen to some really bad Proverbs and take them to heart. And you know, garbage in, what garbage out, right? So I thought I'd end the sermon today with something very simple. I want to give you a sampling of some Proverbs. And I want you to assume that Lady Wisdom is whispering to you right now, and she wants you to hear something. I invite you to listen to the proverb and see if one of these uh, hits home base for you. Do not boast about tomorrow, 
for you do not know what the day will bring. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. She who guards her mouth and her tongue guards her soul from trouble. There are friends who pretend to be friends, and then there are friends who stick closer than a brother. Above all else, guard your heart or affections, for everything you do flows from it. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love overcomes wrongs. Jesus said, no slave can serve two masters. Jesus also said, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. First John, one of the last books in the Bible says, love dispels all fear. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. Those who lose their lives, Jesus said, will find their lives. Will all the worries add one single moment to your life? So don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrows too. Live one day at a time. Yes, that's in our Bible. Live one day at a time at a time. Those who have ears, hear. Amen.